All right, guys, I did want to give us a head start into talking about some of this art um, before we get to next week. Um, so it'll be a little bit about surrealism, um, as well as outlier art, American modernism, regionalism, social, um, social realism. So we'll talk about that a little bit um, as well, and then we'll kind of recap it um, next week additionally. Dolly always thinks everything's about him. Get out of here. So, between World War I and World War II, Europe had really changed um, by the time the armistice was signed in 1918. Feeling alienated, unable to imagine themselves as a part of society that had plunged more or less heedlessly into the ca catastrophe of World War I, artists responded in different ways. Some adopted the anti-aesthetics of Dada, while others affirmed Western cultural traditions by resuming the classicalism of early generations. The aesthetic posture showing the greatest resilience and optimism was probably that staked out by constructivists, such as those allied with Bajas who believed that Western civilization could redeem itself with the help of art. So really last week we focused in on constructivism um, at person like having to do with Bajas um, and those groups as well. Um, but what we see here is that surrealism did neither of these and instead it really focused on responding to the moment by reasserting the invincibility of artistic genius. So they believed sort of inherently that artists had um, could be born with this innate idea of um, genius. So from the Renaissance period, you have people believing that genius was an innate capacity, divine spark held by few. So you can think about Michelangelo or Leonardo da Vinci. Um, the Renaissance, high Renaissance especially, really focus on genius, this idea of genius, as part of um, just innately who you are to be able to create this sort of um, powerful art. So in the 18th and 19th century, conceived of genius in terms of emulation and intellectual attainment, and romantic artists reintroduced the idea of genius as something inborn but rare, a creative faculty that gave rise to originality. So surrealism really focused on the notion of genius by um, romanticism um, as exceptional and marked by originality, but traces its source to the mind's unconscious. So instead of focusing specifically on um, it being something you're born with, they're focusing more on um, the mind's idea um, and that um, the power of the genius comes from your unconscious. So in your ability to kind of tap into these raw impulses, desires, and fears that Freud came, claimed were seated in the unconscious. Uh, we're going to talk about Sigmund Freud and how he sort of applies to this. And then this was the only way an artist could achieve authenticity. Of course, what we will find um, is that the idea of genius is a little sort of skewed in that most ideas of genius come down to uh, supporting male artists. So this, like all conceptions of genius, privileged some individuals while rendering it virtually impossible for others to lay claim to it, specifically male genius. The lack of female participants, while also affirming the modernist tendency to view the fem female body as a powerful catalyst for artistic experimentation, kind of left women out um, of this conversation of artistic genius. So instead, women were objects of desire and fear. So we'll see this, especially in surrealism, that um, there's this kind of inherent belief that women um, or people of different races um, are not able to attain this idea of artistic genius, and thus that's why they're not represented in museums um, as much as white male figures. And obviously you'll have scholars like Linda Nochlin um, and other really famous scholars come in and go, uh, that's not how it works. Uh, it has to do with oppression and the way that we treat women and not allowing them to get proper um, artistic education. And thus, they're not able to develop this idea of genius that people so easily suppose um, is kind of the inherent truth, right? So just keep this in mind, because as we look at female artists, you'll see sort of how the surrealists treat them. So Andre Breton is really the artist to develop surrealism. Um, he grew kind of disillusioned with the Dada artistic period um, and started focusing in on um, a new period he could develop himself. So 
he started focusing on automatic writing, which is a big part of surrealism. Um, with Philippe Sopalt, he explored possibilities of automatic writing, pure psychic automatism. One of the fundamental precepts of surrealism was defined by Breton as a dictation of thought in the absence of any control exercised by reason and beyond any aesthetic or moral preoccupation. Um, and then he brought people in who could connect to his work and then using these different ideas of the subconscious and unconscious. So they believe they could access their unconscious in sort of the, um, you're kind of creating works in this automatic writing fashion so that whatever comes to mind, you paint, you write, um, and thus you're able to tap into this unconscious genius idea. Um, so for example, you can kind of think of like all these like parlor games or whatever that you play with your friends. Like, um, I don't know why I call them parlor games. What am I, 90? Um, <laughs> for each person to write a part of a sentence. You probably did this in like kindergarten where someone would write the first part of the sentence and then you'd cover it up and someone would write the second part of the sentence and cover it up. So they would do this in their surrealist groups to try to develop this automatic writing. So, for example, they made the sentence, the exquisite corpse will drink the young wine. Um, and so their group became called the exquisite corpse. So they would work in doing this with drawings as well. You probably did this, again, passing around a piece of paper and covering up, covering up parts and people kind of expanding on these drawings so that you get this um, pure idea of automatic creation in drawing or writing. And as you probably have noticed, there's this great focus on Sigmund Freud. He writes the book, The Interpretation of Dreams in 1899, uh, as well as other books as well during the early 1900s. And so the surrealists really focus on his work. Freudian theories very, were, were very popular. Psychoanalysis promised to explain, maybe even cure, human aggression and deviance, assertion that personality, personalities develop in early childhood, largely in response to thwarted and repressed sexual desires. And then we'll talk um, inherently how Freudian theories um, are kind of sexist and therefore continue this idea of women not being able to get artistic genius um, and kind of why a lot of his theories and ideas have been um, kind of disproven by psychologists. So um, Andre Breton writes the Manifesto of Surrealism in 1924. This is a little excerpt from your book. Um, Surrealism, noun, masculine, what a shocker. Pure psychic automatism by which it is intended to express, express either verbally or in writing the true function of thought. Thought dictated in the absence of all control exerted by reason and outside all aesthetic or moral preoccupations. Encyclopedia philosophy. Surrealism is based on the belief in the superior reality of certain forms of association heretofore neglected, in the omnipotence of the dream, and in the disinterest play of thought. It leads to the permanent destruction of all other psychic mechanic mechanisms, mechanisms, goodness, and to its, to is substitution for them in all solution of the principal problems of life. So with the development of surrealism, they attacked the rational emphasis of Western culture, again, became disillusioned with Dadaists. So kind of, you can think of surrealism as um, a um, predecessor or child of the Dada period. Uh, Breton wrote in 1934 that we still live under the rule of logic um, and European civilization focused too much on science, progress, comfort, and success. And they instead needed to focus on fantasy, imagination, play, unconscious, subconscious, etc. So Breton outlined his view of Freud's theory that the human psyche is a battleground where the rational civilized forces of the conscious mind struggle against the irrational, instinctual urges of the unconscious, improve society through freeing the individual to experience and safely express forbidden desires and urges. So through um, Contacting your sort of unconscious, you could express your forbidden ideas and desires that aren't um, approved by society in general, and thus sort of um, get, you could feel sort of that you could express those desires and sexualities in a safe place. Coming to face with one's inner demons in our context may allow them to not release them in the real world. Liberate the unconscious through dream analysis, free association, automatic writing, word games, hypnotic trances, and again, autom 
automatism, I can't know why, what is with that word today, variety of manual techniques which were designed to release art from conscious control and thus produce new surprising forms. So with the development of surrealism by Audrey Breton, he really had a lot of control over who he allowed in the group and who he didn't. So he excludes sort of purposefully women from surrealism, even though we're going to talk about some female surrealists, um, but he sort of decided who could or couldn't be in the group. Uh, we're going to be focusing on kind of two sections here that the book divides uh, surrealism up into uh, abstract biomorphic surrealism and sort of more Freudian devoted surrealism. So the abstract biomorphic surrealism focuses on Max Ernst and Joe Moreau, who we're going to look at, um, which very much focus, focus on automatism, automatism, dictation of thought without control of the mind. And then um, versus Dali, Tangai, and Rene Magritte are going to focus more on Freudian devoted surrealism. So uh, presenting meticulous detail, recognizable scenes and objects that are taken out of the natural context, distorted and combined in fantastical ways as they might be in dreams. Um, again, images of the conscious and Freud. Um, Though Salvador Dali said he had control over his unconscious, um, which seems a little preposterous, and Freud said that's not possible, um, but he did say that about um, his production of art. So the first surrealist we're going to talk about is Max Ernst, and he really started in the Dada period. Um, we didn't talk about him, we kind of skipped over him, um, but this is his celebs work from 1921, which is considered part of um, more of the Dada period. And in this work, he took a photograph of a Sudanese corn bin and transformed it into a sinister mechanical monster. So this reusing of found objects very much in the Dada period. And it's like really easy to see um, how he took this really weird form um, and recreated it into this mechanical monster. Um, and he's very much a pro strange surrealist ideas in this work. The work's title also came from a childish German rhyme that begins the elephant from celebs has sticky yellow bottom grease, and he combined them with these other um, surrealist objects. So really with his Dada work combined with um, his idea and um, move into surrealism, he created Two Children Are Threatened by a Nightingale from 1924. And this is a really interesting work because it's um, very much kind of a collage mixed with paint. So you have pieces that are made of wood um, and other materials. So it's a green landscape that you see in which all of these figures are horrified of this tiny bird here. Um, as you can see, um, I couldn't find a close-up in the correct color, so this one's kind of green, um, but you can see it. So we have these two figures that are running away, um, one holding a knife, and you can see the emphasis on elements um, that are collage, like this gate that comes out into your viewpoint, right, and onto the frame, as well as this um, house as well. You also have this, this other figure that's running away with a child um, and actually looks like it's kind of reaching for this realistic doorknob that's right here. And so, again, um, this work is very much kind of a Dada slash surrealist work in that it doesn't really have, a, we don't have a super good idea of what it means other than you sort of have this representation of fear for these figures in this kind of little collaged piece. And it's quite small. Um, it's not a very big composition at all. and um, he had this title, this um, Two Children Are Threatened by a Nightingale, um, etched in the frame in which he built the story off of. And they're going to do that with surrealist work, um, often kind of taking works from um, psychoanalysis books or books by Freud and then reinterpreting them as paintings. One of my favorite works by Max Ernst um, I, it has always kind of fascinated me because it's a very strange um, scene that's kind of really gorgeous and has really intense detail um, and it's at the Peggy Guggenheim Museum in Venice and it's just one of those images that really stands out um, as Max Ernst kind of moves into his illusionistic surrealism creating this kind of unsettling scene. So you have this figure um, potentially that uh, this is the bride figure um, and this is the male figure, or this is, um, I'll kind of break down kind of the different interpretations of um, these creatures. All of them kind of come from past images, um, like you can see 
the theatrical images. Oh, here's a detail as well. So, so a lot of the ideas harken back um, to Gustave Moreau. A lot of these images and features and details harken back to him, um, as well as the swollen figures of Lucas Cronach. You can see that in these women, as well as kind of this scene um, built by Giorgio de, Chico, de Chirico. You can see this kind of movement in space with the tile. And so you have these kind of garish colors, animals and monster forms. Um, there's definitely a sense that this is kind of the blunt um, phallic symbolism here. You have this kind of green bird um, and piercing the figure um, with this bow and arrow, like this penetration, right? That's kind of obvious. Um, this creature might having to do with fertility. Um, there's some sort of variety of interpretation um, in that this could be the bride figure in the center or that this is the bride figure on the right um, and then that image being reflected in this back painting. Um, so it kind of depends on um, who you believe or who you decide to sort of um, think that their theory is the most interesting. Um, a lot of these ideas harken back to Max Ernst having um, a bird alter ego, um, which is Lop Lop, who is the superior of the birds. Um, again, having kind of to do with the subconscious and these ideas, um, Freud has, Freud, Max Ernst has his own kind of um, bird figure that's his alter ego. And so there is some belief that this figure in the center um, is supposed to be um, Max Ernst, as represented in Lop Lop. Lop Lop. And the bride, um, who may be there then on the right, is uh, Leona Carrington, who he was dating at the time. Now, surrealists are kind of fun and interesting because um, a lot of them have kind of weird sexual lives. Um, a lot of them are kind of open to sex and um, ideas. And so you'll see kind of um, some interesting behavior by different surrealists. And you can kind of decide whether or not you think it's good or bad or appropriate or whatever. I just think it's kind of fun to um, look at. So let's say here that Max Ernst is um, focusing on Leonora Carrington, which was one of his girlfriends at some point. Um, he was a very interesting figure and had a lot of wives. Um, for example, um, on the left here, we have Louise Strauss Ernst. Uh, she was um, Max Ernst's first wife. He leaves her for Mary Bertha Arinke. This is him here right on the left with her and then goes on to marry um, Peggy Guggenheim after her. Uh, Peggy Guggenheim currently owns a tirement of the bride and is in her museum and so maybe it's Lenora Carrington or maybe it has something to do with Peggy Guggenheim because she did own this work. Um, and would Max Ernst have said it was his girlfriend who he left Peggy Guggenheim for? I don't know. Um, so here, finally, we have Peggy Guggenheim, um, who he leaves for Lenora Carrington, who he does not marry. And then finally, Dorothea Tanning, um, which he does marry and spends the rest of his life with. So you have these interesting moves between sexual figures, which could very much have to do with how you interpret these works. So let's say you're talking about this work um, and this being Lenora Carrington, um, would he have admitted that again to Peggy Guggenheim who owns it? Um, would he have said that it was an alternative um, interpretation? So you can kind of think about all these ideas that surrealists are kind of playing with as they sort of interpret and rethink um, their ideas of their sexuality and their unconscious. Moving on from Max Ernst, we have Juan Miro. Uh, he was a Spanish artist that never really felt connected to Cubism and started really working with surrealism when he moved to Paris and met Breton and so really started engaging with surrealist ideas, um, focusing again on this kind of automatism um, and the biomorphic version of surrealism. So the book has this work and it tells you to look at all these details. Then it gives you that tiny little picture to look at it from, which is also oh helpful. Um, so this is Carnival of Harley Quinn from 24 to 25. If you remember what a Harley Quinn is, um, we also call them Saltimbinques <clears throat> when we talked about them originally. So remember that this is a um, type of jokester 
um, or entertainer. So we have this, this is really the first surrealist work that Miro made with this very playful scene. And it has this kind of grayish room, kind of grayish tan, um, with all of these different weird variety of figures and creatures that are kind of just moving around. So the book goes through and kind of describes all of them to you. So like on the left, um, you have this ladder that has um, an attached ear along with an eyeball. Then you have this kind of little creature, um, which is a man with a disc-shaped head who sports a long-stemmed pipe beneath a tendril mustache and stares sadly at the spectator. Um, calling him man is, man is probably a little bit of a stretch, but he does kind of have like a little hat with a peacock feather here, as well as this kind of little dragon figure as well. Um, and here are his little hands and a pipe. At his side, we have the little insect. Here we have this little yellow and blue wings um, coming kind of out of this jack-in-the-box um, dice. So basically, as you move through this work, you get the sense that not only is this sort of fantastical, um, but you do have forms you kind of recognize, kind of don't. Um, it's really just about this kind of fun, vivid world um, where these creatures move in space and you can't really have your, your eye doesn't really focus on one place. It kind of jumps around the whole, um, canvas. He continues with this with painting from 1933. These, this was a part of a group of paintings based on collages of realistic details torn from newspapers and pasted on cardboard. He would take these kind of motifs and then abstract them further and further and further. So um, as the book says, it says, although this work appears completely non-figurative, many observers have found a resemblance between the mysterious forms and animals, such as a seated dog at the upper left, um, which is right here. So using these organic and abstract shapes to really sort of tap into his unconscious or subconscious um, through artwork and surrealism. So this is pretty typical of his work um, in the surrealist field. The book also brought in this really weird sculpture that um, is kind of fun, so I thought well, we would throw it in here. Um, surrealist objects proliferated in the 1930s, and this one consists of a wood cylinder that holds a cavity of a high-heeled doll-sized leg that fetish, the fetidistic nature of which typifies surrealism eroticism. We also have this stuffed parrot. Here you have this leg. I not mean to move the picture here, um, of which I have a close-up, so you can kind of see this stuffed doll leg with the tiny shoe, um, as well as this piece of cork and this stuffed parrot. Um, and then at the bottom, it is all staged on a hat with a little fish that swims through the brim. So again, these kind of juxtaposition of disparate objects. Um, you could think about Duchamp and his work with ready-mades um, was meant to evoke surprise and trigger further associations in the mind of the viewer. Guy Stengi uh, is a very interesting surrealist artist, and he's very much inspired by De Chirico, and you can really see how Dali is really inspired by him. Um, he was self-taught and became part of the surrealist movement in 1926, and this is where we are moving into the group of artists that are really focused in on um, Freudian theories. So... Um, him as well as Dali, and then potentially Magritte, um, all kind of believe and focus in on um, attempt to picture the desires and fears contained in the unconscious, an endeavor that Freud would dismiss as both pointless and impossible. As I said about Dali, who believed he could sort of um, obtain his unconscious sort of um, by his own personal will, um, Freud very much believed that that was impossible. So, but they're very much using those ideas and trying to um, build off of them. So this is his work, Maman Papa Est Blesse, which is Mama Papa is Wounded from 1927. It's this really weird kind of haunting image. Um, not only is this kind of infinite perspective depth um, rendered simply by graded color and a sharp horizon line of vast, empty, vast emptiness and intimate enclosure, um, but there's this kind of these ambiguous organic shapes. Um, this one very much kind of looks like a cactus to me, but um, the rest of them are um, just kind of like weird little shapes that kind of stand in the space. And then you have this smoke that's kind of billowing in from the right. 
there is this sense of doom for the figures, solitary. Um, they seem kind of solitary and lonely. He originally took this title um, and others from a psychiatric textbook, or so he said. Um, he said, I remember spending a whole afternoon with Andre Breton, leafing through books on psychiatry in the search for statements of patients, which could be used for titles of paintings. So we talked about this a little bit with Max Ernst, um, and Tanguy is very much doing that as well. Um, but as the book says, states, this title actually came from a book about paranormal phenomenon um, called Trait de Metaphysique by Dr. Charles Richet, um, who coined the term ectoplasm, which is really interesting. So um, we're going to look at, let me show you, you with this link, but this is the book um, in which uh, Tangi got his title. So, and what I found interesting was that you can actually kind of look at this book um, and get a sense of um, what he was writing about, although it's in French. But I thought it was interesting that this was um, archived for us online so that we can see sort of where um, Tangi got his inspiration is from this book originally. Now, as the title seems to imply um, that there's kind of a father, mom, and child figure, um, as in the title say, Mama, Papa is wounded, um, and these are the figures in which we believe might be the female or the, the mom, the dad, and the child, um, although we're not entirely sure. Um, other interpretations I've read of this work reference violence of World War I, heightened anxiety that followed um, th that period. The standing yellow figure may represent a father, cactus mother, or an amorphous mass child, um, but again, still a lot of amb ambiguity. So you can sort of think any figure um, is the mom, dad, or child. It's kind of ambiguous at this point, like what he was trying to do. Again, playing with this idea of um, tapping into his unconscious and using um, psychology and psychiatry textbooks to um, get his titles. So, of course, uh, we have to talk about Salvador Dali, who is one of the most famous surrealists, um, and probably the one that everyone has heard of, um, at least. And he um, was a Spaniard and was educated traditionally in art school, and he was highly imaginative, um, indul enjoyed indulging in unusual and grandiose behavior, as we will see. Um, not only his paintings, but his writings, his utterances, his actions, his appearance, his mustache, and his genius um, for publicity have made the word surrealism a common noun in all languages, denoting an art that is irrational, erotic, and mad, and of course, fashionable. If you kind of want to watch him talk and kind of get an idea for what kind of person he is, um, you can watch him on like What's My Line. Um, I'll include that link um, on the on Canvas. Um, but he is very much sort of an eccentric figure. A lot of his images kind of give you that sense. Um, he drew up. He grew up in Spain, and he had a lot. Um, of interaction with Gaudi's work that we talked about. And so he was very much invested in the artistic world before he sort of um, came into focusing on surrealism. And really Breton really encouraged him a lot. Now he very much focused on Sigmund Freud and his work and is very devoted to the ideas um, of the man's universe and sensations, sexual symbolism, and ideographic imagery. Um, so a lot of his work really tries to focus in on the subconscious and the unconscious and thinking about his childhood and sort of his sexual um, deviances, potentially. Dali is kind of an interesting figure in that he wrote like a whole biography about himself and his childhood. And it's very elaborate and tells all these stories about how he was in love with all these men and these women and all these children and he's kind of eccentric and you get this sense that like you might not actually be able to believe anything that he says because is he really telling the truth or does he think that he's come from his unconscious with these lost memories or is it all like a performance so like i'll give you a solid example here um when he was, um, before Dolly was born, he had an older brother who was born nine months before him, also named Salvador, who died. And um, later in life, when he was about five years old, 
He claims that his parents took him to the grave of his brother and told them that he was his brother's reincarnation and that they had named him Salvador um, because they believed it was his son, their son being reincarnated. So again, you start to question sort of his integrity um, and not that it's not part of who he is as an artist, but it's you start to question if these stories are really true or not. So take everything with the, that he says with a grain of salt, um, as far as I'm concerned. Um, like Max Ernst, we have some sexual drama. Um, he met his lifelong partner and muse Gala uh, in 1929, and that's her here with him. And at that time, she was married to Paul Eluard. So she was Paul, or she was Gala Eluard. And um, weirdly enough. Um, as Dolly steals his gala, kind of, from Paul, who because they're already married, um, there appears to be a picture from 1934 in which you have Dali and Gala, who are very happy, and here is Eluard with his new wife, Noosh, uh, who I believe was a performance artist. And so both couples were married in 1934 to different people, um, which is really weird. So again, sort of some sexual drama um, going on behind the scenes of surrealism. But Gala really became his muse. He makes a lot of work focused on her. Um, many of the female figures are based on her. You can see kind of how this looks like her face. Um, this is her here. So he be she became a big figure in his life and his work. And by the time he met Gala, his style was really developed um, and he was really starting to take off as a surrealist artist. So he had by now formulated the theoretical basis of his paintings, described as paranoic critical, the creation of a visionary reality from the elements of visions, dreams, memories, and psychological or pathological distortions. This is one of the works that the book mentions, which I've never really focused on before, but it's an interesting sort of precursor um, to some of the works that we're going to look at. And he's really focused on this kind of microscopic brand of realism that Dali, um, that he deployed of the dream world, and where he takes these kind of tiny collaged parts and breaks them up into these paintings. So um, this lion appears to be something that's collaged that he used sort of over and over in this imagery um, and then sort of built the painting off of that. So you have these tiny, these like little rocks, they cast shadows into the desolate landscape, all these elements very much that Tangi is using. You can think about him um, as a precursor to Dali and his work. Um, you have all these kind of weird images that show up. So the book talks about like an army of arms that's occurring here with these figures. Again, the lion appears. Um, you also have the ants crawling on rocks, which becomes um, a prominent theme that we're going to see literally in the next two works that are very famous by him, um, in which they symbolize decay. And um, he claims that during this painting, um, he was having a courtship with Gala, saying the experience of intense sexual anxiety led him to paint this work in which desires were always represented by terrorizing images of lion's heads. He's also using the Trompe L'Oeil, uh, similar to when we talked about Brock um, and um, Picasso using it in their surrealist, surrealist cubist work, um, in which he's using realistic imagery to create an optical illusion. And he was doing this as a way to make the dream world more tangible, using familiar objects like watches, insects, pianos, telephones, old prints, or photographs, and then transform these regular images into nightmare images, um, somnambulism and paranoia, which is like sleepwalking, um, I believe. And so he was using all of these ideas in the dream world to sort of think about dreams and um, subconscious and unconscious ideas. So this first work that we're going to focus on by Dali um, in sort of his mature period outside of the work we just looked at, um, this is the first one is The Great Masturbator from 1929. And this is a really interesting snapshot of him. He painted it when he was 25. And Dali had a strange connection to sex. Um, there, He would say that he had this um, 
these sort of sexual fears. His father would leave out explicit photos of people suffering from advanced untreated venereal diseases to educate him. And he had this sort of connection with fear and anxiety um, along with sex. So in this image, you have a distorted profile, um, which Dolly often used to represent himself. You can see, we're going to look at this in the persistence of memory as well, um, but this is um, a profile. This is an eye, eyelash, eyebrow, um, hair, so you get the sense of that. And it morphs into this female figure who's sort of um, moving up to potentially um, give pleasure to this male figure that's on the right here um, in which you have sort of cuts and wounds uh, and he's also still wearing um, his underwear as well so you have this kind of um, focus on Gala again potentially this nude female figure being Gala and then potentially this being Dolly or some sort of representation of Dolly as well um, and really sort of um, making it about this sort of sexual fear that Dolly would have had. And you can sort of connect them with things like, um, we again, we have this lion head, which talks about um, sexuality and tension, like in the previous work that we looked at. You also have these like weird pieces um, of blood that are splattering down into um, this portrait of him. You also, again, have a grasshopper um, as well as ants. Uh, we didn't see the grasshopper before, I'm sorry, but we have a grasshopper here. Um, and Dolly had a great fear of grasshoppers, and the appearance of one of them alludes to hysterical fear and loss of voice or self-control. And then you have, again, ants to symbolize decay and um, potentially other things, like you have two figures, an egg for fertility. Um, so... Dolly is kind of tapping into all of these different elements to talk about this kind of subconscious uh, fear of sexuality and some of the things that he was struggling with personally at the time. Persistence of Memory is probably the most famous work by him. You've probably seen this one um, from 1931. And um, at this time, he was 27. And he really focused in on a dream landscape here in which he... Um, is kind of discrediting the world of reality in its entirety and really focusing on um, the falling apart of objects in um, this image. So, um, and it's quite tiny if you didn't know it. He's still creating these small paintings with this intense amount of detail um, and focusing in on these objects. There's a lot of different symbolism in this work. Um, for example, the cliffs that are far off to the right here um, are the Golden Cliffs of Catalonia, which was Dali's home. Um, again, the same infinite space that Tanguy is using in his work, where you feel like it kind of goes on forever into this sort of abyss. You also have the representation of dripping watches. Um, this expression of the subconscious. It also kind of juxtap juxtaposes the idea of hard and soft. And really kind of the, the watches are really where you get the interpretation of this work, which is that um, how silly kind of the passing of time is in the dream state itself. So they just kind of melt, right? They have no meaning in the dream world. Um, you can even think about like how you have this dream, right? That takes course over days or years. And um, so he's talking about this sort of um, lack of a real sense of time when you're dreaming. Um, it also had to kind of do with Einstein um, and his theories of relativity that were coming out. Um, so really sort of breaking down how time doesn't have value. Um, the soft watches are an unconscious symbol of the relativity of space and time, a surrealist meditation on the collapse of our notions of a fixed cosmic order. Or I said Einstein's theory of relativity, right? Hopefully. Um, we also have that this uh, tiny fly appears to be a human. We're casting a human shadow as the sun hits it. So again, dealing with kind of dreams and dream landscapes, um, which is right here. You also have, um, this look, appears to be some kind of pocket watch that the ants are crawling in again. So again, symbolizing decay. You also have that self-portrait that I talked about in The Great Masturbator. Here again, we have eyelashes, eyebrow, 
um, I think this is a nose and something else. Um, but again, this kind of melting portrait that is supposed to represent Dolly. And you see it in The Great Masturbator as well as other works here in which he represents himself as this kind of melting face. Um, he very much got the idea of melting clocks from um, Camembert cheese, which was in the book. Um, we have this quote, Dali described these forms as nothing more than the soft, extravagant, solitary, paranoid, critical Camembert cheese of space and time. He painted this work one night after dinner when after all the guests were gone, he contemplated the leftover Camembert cheese melting on the table. When he then looked at the landscape and progress in his studio with the shoreline cliffs and branches and branchless olive trees, the image of soft watches came to him as a means of representing the condition of softness. This pictorial metamorphosis in which matter is transformed from one state into another is a fundamental aspect of surrealism. So again, here I have some images of camembert cheese because it can be both solid and liquid. Um, but again, the breakdown of time um, in um, when you're thinking about dreams and dreamscapes. He's created more works about the persistence of memory. This is called the disintegration of persistence of memory. Um, he started working a lot with math and um, mathematical elements. So a lot of that kind of includes um, the repetition of shapes and the breakdown of forms. Um, so he does continue this uh, idea later in life. Again, this is one of those works that you see over and over. There are so many parodies of this work, which is ridiculous. Um, so here is uh, SpongeBob SquarePants, um, among others. So a very popular and important work um, to Dolly's um, large abundance of work that he did. I also did want to mention this fun book um, that I recently purchased, and I just think that it's such an interesting aspect of um, Dali's life that he made a cookbook. It's called Dali Les Dinners de Gala um, from 1973. And him and Gala would throw these really, really crazy um, dinner parties. And they thus created this kind of really weird cookbook. And the images are all painted by Dali. Um, and they're all kind of crazy surrealists with the weirdest recipes. So it's one of those things um, that isn't really talked about in textbooks as much, but I think it's such a weird um, part of his creation and work. Um, and he has recipes like thousand-year-old eggs, veal cutlets stuffed with snails, frog pasties, toffee with pine cones, um, etc. So really interesting that he kind of branched out into this um, other area of work and of surrealism. Um, and this is him throwing a dinner party and he would throw, they would have these parties where everyone dressed up and um, kind of were, they were surrealists in their own right in many ways, as you can tell from this image. The next artist is Rene Magritte. He's very much part of um, the surrealist mode that is kind of part of Freudian ideas, but also um, kind of on his own path. He was very much sort of a low-key personality um, in Breton's sort of circle. Breton had kind of lukewarm feelings about him, and so um, his work wasn't explored as much. But I think his work is really interesting and valuable. Um, as the book says, it's how we read visual images as part of a cult, like how his work um, is invested in how we read visual images as a part of a code system of signs coincided with linguistic and philosophical investigations that led to the modern field of semiotics. Um, so a lot of his work kind of deals with signs and words and their connection to one another. So for example, um, this is the work, This Is Not a Pipe um, or Treachery of Images from 1929. And here we have um, an image of a pipe um, in which he states that this is not a pipe. Um, and the idea is that, well, yes, it isn't a pipe because it's a picture of a pipe, right? Um, but it starts to break down these ideas of what is or isn't something. Um, 
In the book, it says this masterpiece of surrealism creates a three-way paradox out of the conventional notion of objects that corresponds to words and images. So when you start breaking down these ideas about Foucault and kind of what images and ideas mean, um, he's really trying to kind of make you think about it. So giving you an image of a pipe and saying it's not a pipe, oh, well, of course it isn't a pipe because it's an image of a pipe, but in reality, it's a pipe, if that makes sense. Um, it starts to break down sort of how we see and think about images. Another one that does this is The Human Condition from 1933. This is uh, a landscape that is framed in a window. So think about back to Open Window by Matisse and these other artists that are focusing on window scenes. He has here that um, the painting literally gives you the rest of the information that you would see in through this window, right? So the real space versus the spatial illusion, um, it's very much sort of implying that either the painting um, is less than the real landscape or it's better than the real landscape. Um, although in reality, both are painted fictions because it's a painting of a landscape within a painting of a landscape, if that makes sense, right? So Rene Magritte painted this image and within the image, he has a landscape painted on a canvas, if that makes sense. Um, so you very much have to think about like the image and then what the image of the image is, sort of this layer upon layer of trying to think about um, optical illusions and that sort of thing, right? It's kind of a tongue twister or a, kind of makes your brain hurt a little. Um, I also kind of think, Think about it like this, which is that there are so many people who kind of live experiences through their phones. Like let's say you're videotaping, um, like your parents are videotaping you dancing on stage when you were a little kid. They're watching it through their phone, right? So they're not even watching you on the stage. They're watching you through their phone because they want to capture it, but by capturing it, they're missing that actual moment, right? So they have the... They have the video of what happened, but they don't they didn't actually ever see what really happened. So you can kind of think about these ideas when people are always on their phone or always taking pictures of what they're doing, that they're kind of living their lives through the phone and looking at landscapes through their phone, right? Does that make sense to some extent? I'm trying to bring it into to the 21st century. This is another really famous work by him that you've probably seen and didn't know it was by him, um, Son of Man from 64. This is uh, a self-portrait of himself uh, in an overcoat and a bowler hat standing in front of a short wall, but the man's face is obscured by a green apple. Um, this is supposed to be part of a metaphor in which the apple is hiding the face. Um, things are always hidden and do not see what is visible. Even if you see someone's face, you're sort of seeing the outside versus the inside of um, who someone really is. So again, really playing with these sort of ideas and constructs um, in surrealism. Very different from what like Dali and Tanguy and um, all these other artists, Max Ernst, uh, Jean Miro, are doing. Now, there's an interesting place for sort of women um, artists and those sort of um, not of the male gender. However, the book places um, Claude Cahoon with the women in Surrealists, in which I tend to not entirely agree, as um, although Claude Cahoon was born Lucy Schwab, it seems to appear that he wanted in some respect to be a woman, and it's, or to be a man, um, and so I'm, I'm not entirely sure if we have a sense of what pronoun they wanted to use or anything like that, um, so I decided not to put um, Calhoun in the Women in Surrealism section. Um, so I'm going to sort of break down his art outside of that. So Claude Calhoun was very much known for their self-portraits in which uh, he assumed different personas and trying to sort of undermine these traditional concepts of gender roles. And he lived with his or her um, lifelong partner, uh, Marcel Moore, who is a.k.a. Susan Malherb, um, and it was, so <laughs> Marcel Moore is Claude Cahoon's stepsister, which is pretty weird, um, but 
they became sort of inherent collaborators as they were kind of loners and ostracized, um, probably because they were viewed as lesbians or homosexuals or whatever the case may be at the time. And so they really started to play with these ideas of um, uh, costuming and gender and really trying to break down these norms. Um, Cahoon was publishing articles in journals stating, controversial theories that introduce the possibility of a third sex, uniting masculine and feminine traits, but existing as neither one nor either. Um, and Cahoon suffered a lot um, when World War II happens and sort of the Nazi takeover. Um, Cahoon and her lover were both, or his lover, I'm going to mess you guys up with these, I'm switching between pronouns. Um, following his arrest and imprisonment for resisting Nazis, and they were also sort of protesting him at the same time. They were sentenced to death um, for resisting Nazi power, but never um, occurred because of the end of the war. So um, Cahoon and Moore were both producing sort of images and um, trying to communicate between cells. So this is Cahoon at the end of the war um, when uh, they leave um, the prison that the Nazis put them in. So a lot of Cahoon's work Cahin. Um, Cahoon's work really plays with um, this idea of gender bending um, and costuming and that sort of thing. So for example, this work is I'm in Training, Don't Kiss Me, which is inscribed on this um, shirt that Cahoon is wearing. And then you have all of these sort of elements um, like the painted lips and spit curls, painted on nipples, um, as well as this decidedly coy and feminine look. So very much playing with this sort of feminine persona um, in which Cahoon is sort of teasing this idea of a bodybuilder female figure. Cahoon would continue to do this in works like Untitled Self-Portrait with Mirror from 28, um, presenting um, Cahoon as a bold androgynous and doubled by the mirror reflection, um, using sort of lush, luxurious tones in the checkerboard jacket, highlighted hair, and smooth sun-kissed skin. Um, and a mirror is kind of an in art is used as a convenient way to expose two enticing views of a subject. Um, and Cahoon is looking away from the mirror and engaging with and meets the viewer's gaze and is sort of rejecting this idea of being the passive quote unquote woman who is visually consumed by themselves, instead sort of approaching the viewer and um, kind of thinking about themselves as an individual. You even have that um, Cahoon is kind of hidden when you look at um, them here, the coat kind of hides their neck, but it's completely exposed in the mirror. So playing with these ideas of gender as well as sort of what the interior is um, of one's sort of um, personality and who they are as an individual and who they wanna be. Um, so showing these sort of two different images of themselves. And Cahoon also did another version with um, their lover Marcel Moore in which um, they did the same thing. But this image is very different, sort of more, um, not quite as revealing as Cahoon's is because Cahoon is playing with all these different sort of elements of um, the jacket and whatnot versus Marcel Moore seems a little more straightforward. Now, moving into women in surrealism, we're going to focus on two different female surrealists that I really like. Um, but Andre Breton really had no desire in allowing um, women to be a part of surrealism. This work is by Renee Magritte called The Hidden Woman. And uh, it says, I do not see the woman hidden in the forest. And you have all of these famous surrealists around the outside with their eyes closed. So if you can sort of recognize them, here is Dali. Here is Breton, um, Tengi is here. Uh, those are the only ones I recognize offhand. But um, women were sort of muses first and artists second. The female figure was the supreme symbol for the erotic, um, but surrealism was not particularly hospitable to women, except as terrain onto which male artists projected their erotic desires and psychic fears. So although we have kind of famous surrealists females um, now that we look at, they weren't really respected as part of the group um, at the time. Um, as you can see sort of from their material, right, using a female figure as kind of um, an object in their work. So 
Marit Hoppenheim is really famous surrealist female, and her work is just insanely phenomenal. She was an art student in Paris in 1932, um, and it was not even 20 years old by the time she was exhibiting. And a lot of her work is so playful and fun um, that if you like what you see, you should really go check it out, because she's just one of my favorite artists. Um, and early in her career, she does this um, photo photographic series called Veiled Erotic Series um, with Man Ray, who's a very famous surrealist photographer as well. This is Veiled Erotic um, from 34. I think I just said that twice. But um, she's working with Man Ray, who's this really famous photographer here on the right, um, who's producing all these really famous images. And in this image, she has um, this being sort of the one that I would like to focus on, which is that she's standing in front of this wheel um, in the nude. And here you have this sort of um, faux penis that she's sort of created by standing here. Um, and so it looks like she sort of created a penis for herself. And I very much sort of start to think about this connection between Sigmund Freud and all these theories that women um, or that the surrealist seems so obsessed with. And so I put in this whole idea about penis envy um, because uh, Sigmund Freud theorized that when um, females are developing, girls experience anxiety upon realizing that they do not have a penis. And there's kind of a parallel reaction is boys' realization that women do not have a penis, which is castration anxiety. And so a lot of feminists have really broken down this idea, said how sort of silly it is, um, because it means inherently that female sexuality, that um, their genitals, all of these things are inherently defined in relation to men, and that um, men have penises and women don't, and that's how you define their genitalia, right? Which makes no sense. Um, and so women is kind of inherently broken men. And so in this work by... Um, Man Ray, a.k.a. Um, Marit Oppenheim, I think she's kind of playing with this idea um, of sort of gaining this phallic um, form by standing in behind this wheel. Um, for Teacup is probably her most well-known work, um, so titled The Object uh, from 1936, and it is a cup and saucer and spoon covered in Chinese gazelle hair. Um, it was created after a conversation with Picasso in which he said that you could cover anything in fur, um, and she said, even this cup. Um, and so she did just that. So this is one of her most famous works that's at MoMA now. And all of these surrealists kind of had this fun idea of, oh, you could think about drinking hot chocolate out of this cup. Oh, and the pure sexuality of that moment. Um, but of course, you take this object and you make it kind of useless, right? Because there's no possible way that you are going to drink anything out of a cup covered in animal fur. Um, in the book it says, in Oppenheim's ham, this emblem of domesticity and the niceties of social intercourse metamorphized into a hairy object that is both repellent and eroticized, the consummate fetish. Um, Breton called it, Breton called it Le Déjeuner en Fourreau, which is luncheon um, in fur, which I think is commenting on Manet. Uh, that would be my assumption. She did other really great works too that I think sort of really comment on um, women's place in surrealism. So for example, this is um, My Nurse from 1936 in which she's taken two high-hold shoes and kind of turned them into um, like a turkey breast or a chicken breast. Here she has it tied up um, as well as these little details um, on the heels and on a platter. And so playing with kind of female freedom, um, thinking about women um, and their connection with having to wear high heels, um, as well as sort of their place in the kitchen. Um, they're set upside down, frozen in time, unable to move, um, and sort of playing with these ideas of gender roles. Toyin is another uh, famous surrealist artist from the Czech Republic. A lot of artists um, that were focusing on surrealism in that area were really thinking about sexual reform. And this group of surrealists working in the Czech Republic really wanted to kind of break down some of Breton's ideas. So Toyin adopts sort of a genderless persona similar to Claude Cahoon um, in taking up the name Toyin. And um, 
working against Breton, who had claimed in 1928 that he opposed homosexuality and only condoned masturbation if it was accompanied by images of women. So Toyin takes on this gender-neutral pseudonym and challenges women's sexuality and identity in um, some of her collages, which are here um, for you, as well as this work, Relace, um, which means respite or relax. Um, which has to kind of do with sexuality. Here you have a young girl hanging from this kind of um, ballerina bar, gymnasium bar, in which um, their clothing is hiked up over their face and you have their shorts um, exposed here and kind of accompanied by all of these objects that could be um, sexual objects or on like a sack and a riding crop, but we're not sure. So kind of playing with these scary, mysterious ideas, but that very much so have a connection to um, surrealism and breaking into the subconscious and breaking down sort of gender roles. So next here, we are moving into art leading up to World War II um, and some of those ideas and issues um, across America and abroad. So we're gonna talk about is Tarsila do Amaral. Uh, she is considered one of the leading Latin American modern artists. Um, she is described as the Brazilian painter who best achieved Brazilian aspirations for naturalistic expression in modern style. She is really famous for um, bringing sort of this Brazilian modernist style and you'll see it here, you're probably semi-familiar with her work, um, maybe not. Um, but we'll take a look here. She is a member of Grupo do Cinco, uh, which is a group of five Brazilian artists who considered the biggest influence on the modern art movement in Brazil. And she was part of the formation of the Antropophagia movement, um, which means capitalism. I'll show you how to spell that shortly. Um, but they um, wrote this manifesto of anthropology, um, which reclaimed, not anthropology, Anthropophagia, um, which reclaimed the role of cannibalism, which was an accusation on European colonizers leveled against these people and instead exalted it as a hybrid Brazilian culture that consumed and repurposed the traditions and practices of other cultures. So you'll see her create this sort of fun and colorful, colorful scenes of Brazilian life. So for example, this is postcard from 1929. She has this really interesting and creative style um, evident in this work. She really breaks down color and the use of color. You can think about Favist and expressionist ideas and how um, Amaral is very much in that same sort of category, even in the simplification of something like a cactus, right? Um, and in her forms, and you have sort of this image of Brazil looking over this water landscape um, with this little monkey sort of hanging out in the top here. The work we're going to talk about that's really one of her most famous works is Apaporo from 1928, um, which translates to Man Who Eats. This is really where she's developing her figurative style, the shrinking heads and enlarging limbs, um, this really sort of giant spectacular arm, leg and foot of a seated male, fill the painting's foreground, mirroring the solid curvy linear lines of the cactus. And she's combining two different words here, aba meaning man and poro meaning who eats human flesh. So again, having to do with this idea of cannibalism. And she's showing a figure in the nude, right, which she does um, quite often in her work, and even like her little sons that kind of look like pineapples, right? Um, but she's ambiguous in her terms of age, gender, and race. So you can really see um, her style coming out in something like this, right? You have one arm and another arm and one leg, um, but the figurative style is sort of very getting, very much getting abstract. We're moving closer and closer to sort of abstraction. This work is going to be used in the manifest um, of Antropophagio, Fagio. Um, I'm sorry, my Spanish is terrible. Um, but here it is um, used in that uh, manifesto. And here is her husband. She presented it as a gift to him. So she really becomes a symbol of Brazil in a lot of ways, even so much so that um, the closing ceremony at the Olympics in the 2006 in Rio de Janeiro um, used a lot of her style. So you can see um, those colorful strokes that are in her style here. 
as well as here. So here's an example, right, of how she's using these colors and lines um, repeated in um, the closing ceremony at um, the Olympics. Another famous artist we're going to talk about is Bill Trailer. Um, he's a self-taught um, African-American artist from Alabama. He was born into slavery and he spent the majority of life as a sharecropper. I do have a video about him um, in which they give a detailed idea of his sort of life. And I have this um, page that I'm going to put up on the Moodle here, um, which will give you all the links for all of the videos that I talk about as sort of supplementary help. It's really going to give you a rundown of Bill Trailer's life and work. Um, and then you can sort of come back and continue to listen to my PowerPoint. But um, he was really interesting because he's this eyewitness to Civil War, Emancipation, Reconstruction, Jim Crow segregation, migration and urban culture in the South. He lives between these two split times. So he's um, alive in the 1800s to the mid 1900s. And so he's really at these two really interesting interludes in both um, the 19th and 20th centuries. Now he starts drawing when he's 85 and he produced about 1500 pieces of art um, when he was sort of homeless and living on the street and he draws these really interesting figures of um, snakes and individuals and um, dogs and so we're going to look at some of this work it really wasn't until the 1970s that people started to realize sort of his influence he was sort of discovered quote unquote quote um, by charles shannon who was a painter in the south at the time and held exhibitions of his work um, but a lot of his work isn't going to really come to the forefront of art and art history until the 70s. And this is because of this sort of strange category that we talk about. And I wanted to sort of mention it because it's very um, complicated, similarly to like how I think about primitivism and these concepts that seem like they're kind of helpful, but are they? Um, you have to kind of think about it and in your own personal view if you think that it's helpful the problem with calling um, self-taught artists um, outliers it sometimes comes under the definition of calling someone folk or primitive or naive um, so they're not always positive ideas about the artist uh, a lot of this just has to do with art and artists that weren't really in um, the art world as we sort of um, see in museums and museum culture they weren't really um, within art, the artistic community at the time that they're producing art. Um, but you have to think like neither was Van Gogh or artists like this. And so um, you start to think about what these topics and ideas really mean. Um, but we do call Bill Trailer, Trailer an outlier or American vanguard artist. And they play a significant role in modernism but haven't been talked about ex extensively. Obviously, they're sort of hard to categorize because of this, but they're these artists that really have this powerful role in folk tradition and with art in the 20th century that aren't really talked about in sort of classical textbooks. So there are so many artists you can sort of think about this. Um, Jacob Lawrence, we're going to talk about him shortly in his work. Um, this is a work by him that I really like. Um, as well as this is a list of a bunch of other artists who are considered quote-unquote outlier artists. So think about this idea and sort of what the constructions of it are because it definitely starts to feel like it's um, categorizing just sort of black artists underneath this. So you could think about people who are not necessarily brought into the artistic community because of who they are as individuals. Um, which I wouldn't necessarily think is a positive idea. Though when I was Googling outlier artists, they put artists like um, Cindy Sherman in here. And I was like, that's a joke. Um, but anyway, Bill Trailer's art is really interesting. He was creating a lot of it, like I said, when he was homeless. And you can really think about a lot of his work within the contracts of the Emancipation and Civil War and how he's really viewing this change in society that you have from him as an individual going from being a slave to being free, but then what does that freedom really mean? And thinking about sort of race constructs in his work. So we don't know a lot about what this work meant, um, but you can get some idea about plantation life, 
um, maybe about white men and their control of black men and sort of what these images mean. So um, in a introduction by Carrie James Marshall, he sounds a note of challenge to superficial perceptions of an artist who is so embedded in Southern black history and culture forced while he lived always to reassure whites of his subservient harmlessness. So really interesting information by Carol, Carrie James Marshall and some of his work on Bill Trailer. But um, you can start to think about the sort of inherent racism and Southern plantation life that he's giving up in some of these works. Um, some of them very, very dark, like something like Entitled from 39 to 42, which you have um, what look like white men holding... Um, shotguns and chasing black figures up into trees um, and sort of what a dog versus a cat might mean. So thinking about what is really going on in his imagination and how he's thinking through these figures and ideas. I'm really getting such a strong idea out of such a simple composition as well. Here's another one of his works, kind of daunting but also silly, with this um, man holding a uh, leash of a dog. Again, you don't really know what race they are. This could be a white guy, but at the same time he um, paints them all in sort of monochromatic colors, um, so it's hard to know. So, moving into um, this quote-unquote category that I made, which is American Modernism, um, to really talk about Georgia O'Keeffe. Um, because it doesn't seem like she has a really good solid category, so I'm going to throw her into American Modernism here um, to sort of talk about her. So we um, have discussed her a bit previously, and she was born in Wisconsin, and she's really considered the mother of American Modernism. She studied at the School of Art Institute of Chicago, and we're actually going to see a lot of artists at this time studying there, which is really interesting and great. As we've talked about previously, she was married to Alfred Stieglitz, who was a very famous photographer who photographed her, um, about, took about 300 photos of her um, when they were married. And um, he said when he first saw her work, at last, a woman on paper, um, whatever that means. But she has a very unique style, and we're going to talk about her work and how it really contributes and paved the way to sort of American modernism in a lot of ways. So this is one of her works, um, Music Pink and Blue, from um, number two from 1919. I do have a little video that talks about this work from the Whitney. It's a very interesting work on canvas. It almost looks like it is watercolor. It is this really breathtaking study of chromatic relationships and organic forms. And it very much sort of starts to look like her flower works, even though um, it looks like at this point she's not actually looking at a flower or an image of a flower, um, but instead creating this sort of abstraction work. And um, the title suggests very much um, connection with Kandinsky and um, music that he had in his work. So we're going to be talking about Red Canna, which is one of her popular works. This is really what she's well known for as an artist, these really close-up studies of natural forms. She has a really... Um, specific way of handling her oils to create smooth shapes and sp subtle spatial and oh my goodness ambiguities and intense blocks of color and form. There's a lot of pulse with color and energy um, in the creation of a flower. So you can see the breakdown of something like this type of flower into almost abstraction, right, in the use of line and color and texture. Now, where you've probably heard about Georgia O'Keeffe and her people talk about is that a lot of her flowers represent women's genitalia, right? From which she is, for the most part, denied. She doesn't really like that um, she has this reputation for creating flowers that look like vaginas, necessarily. Um, some of this has to do with the fact that um, Stieglitz was taking so many photographs of her that seemed very inherently sexual, or that the fact that Sigmund Freud's ideas were highly popular at the time, and so people were looking for hidden sexuality in these works. Um, so there's this persistence of interpretation linking O'Keeffe's abstractions to female genitalia or sexuality speaks to the distinctions critics and art historians have drawn between O'Keeffe's work and that of her male contemporaries, whose work are rarely subjected to such biological, biological essentialism. 
Um, one critic even stated he found expression in delicately veiled symbolism for what every woman knows, but women heretofore keep to themselves. Um, so whether or not you sort of see this as scholarship being inherently sort of sexist and wanting to see vaginas in her work, um, they kind of do look like vaginas, right? And um, so you can definitely think about that in context with her work um, having to do with rebirth and the formulation of sort of natural forms into vaginal looking shapes, um, etc. As O'Keefe has said about some of her works and look at flowers, when you take a flower in your hand and really look at it, it's your world for the moment. I want to give that world to someone else. Most people in the city rush around so, and they have no time to look at a flower. I want them to see it whether they want to or not. So really sort of investigating the simplicity of the form of the flower and breaking it down to really look at it. So she even wrote this about Red Canna. Abstraction so close up, one is immersed, red swelling from whites to pink soft velvet reds, bleed into liquid rubies, teasing like a swirling skirt, softly blowing in the breeze, morning sunlight looking through the vibrant blood of life awakening, the morning light sun parting, vibrations of pounding hearts. Now this is a subject she focused on a lot, um, flowers especially, but also red canna. She did quite a few versions. Um, I'm giving you four examples um, of them here and sort of how she's breaking down color and shape and light and starting out with something here on the left that looks very sort of Japanese in a lot of ways in the way that she's using watercolor and then sort of starting to break down the form in her color blocking um, with this 1919 example as well as these um, here as well from 1919. And you can see she's even taking this and abstracting it even more by um, removing this texture that she creates um, with this rippling effect in the final work. Whether or not you knew this, Georgia O'Keeffe is really well known for producing some cityscapes as well. She does some really interesting sort of portraits of New York City. This is New York Street with Moon. Um, she started creating some more represent representational works after a lot of these flowers came under the fire right of vaginal imagery. Um, she wanted to paint New York um, not as it was, but how it is felt. And she had a really passion for the skyscraper city and the emotions of the world. So this is the first of many views that she created of this metropolis. This is the dusky sky and the moon peeping out from fluffy clouds. And in the center of which there is a street light with an unearthly aura, um, which you can definitely see here. She is very interested in creating this low angled composition when she looks up at the sky. So you can see that you're kind of down below is a figure looking up into the sky and looking at the tallness of the buildings. It's very sort of daunting to um, look at the city from this way. Here's another one that she's well known for. This is City Night from 1926, in which um, you can see this sort of looming overview of the buildings as well. This seems a little more um, dangerous and scary in that it's very dark, not as sort of inherently colorful as the previous work, and to the extent that even the moon is lower than the building itself, right, even the way that she's painted it, that the moon is lower and you're still being felt to feel very small in the midst of these very tall and strong buildings. Um, it sort of peers over the viewer um, with this exaggerated perspective. So my crane your neck to sort of look up at the sky and look up at the buildings above you. And really thinking about your place um, amongst sort of the New York skyscrapers. Now in 1929, O'Keefe travels to New Mexico and she spends a lot of time there um, in the Southwest as well as New York. And she becomes very well known for her desert motifs as well. Um, so this is one of those well-known works. This is Cow Skull with Calico Roses from 31. Really sort of breaking down against forms um, and colors of the Southwest. So um, you have the sun bleached bones and skulls found in the desert with this very reductive style, um, thinking about um, these single objects. So you kind of have, they kind of feel like still lifes in a lot of way that you have this really sort of um, abstract background and then you have a skull with these sort of simple flower forms. So really becoming more intimately connected with her subject again. 
Um, so instead of looking closely at a flower, looking closely at other objects like skulls. And she does skulls a lot um, in these Southwest works. She's really a famous artist now. Um, in 2014, this painting sold for $44.4 million, would make her the highest selling woman in art. So you have to think like, she has become this sort of major American icon in art. Um, her paintings involve such economy of detail and such skillful distillation of her subject that however, na however naturalistically precise, they somehow become works of abstraction. And she really helps to lead to modernism and abstraction in um, the United States in a lot of ways. Next, we're gonna be looking at photography. Photography is a very important feature in American art um, at this time. And other important events that we have coming right before we enter into World War II um, are um, the 1927 Charles Lindbergh. He has his first transatlantic flight, um, as well as the stock market crash into the Great Depression, which is really only alleviated um, by World War II in the 1940s. So we have a lot of suffering going on um, in the Great Depression and a lot of people traveling to try to find work and food, as well as the Dust Bowl in the 1930s. Hopefully in modern art, you also learn a little bit about the Works Progress Administration, which was established by um, FDR in 1935, which helped to um, give money to artists to help them work, and they sort of become, became um, employees of the government. Um, Dorothea Lang being one of them, who we're going to talk about in a second, and Aaron Douglas. I did talk about Dorothea Lang last week, or the week before, um, because she is very much considered kind of a first wave um, artist, and I talked about um, her creation of the image of the migrant mother. Um, as she photographed this tired, anxious, um, but powerful woman with her three children in a working camp um, outside in California. And it's, it becomes this very sort of reproduced image that is called the Madonna of the Depression. Um, and she's really considered one of the first documentary photographers, um, even though she very much kind of posed figures um, in a lot of ways that weren't necessarily naturalistic, um, even removing this thumb in the photograph for sort of visual um, reasons. Oh, wait. So she's photographed, the migrant mother was photographed for three of her children, but had seven total children. Um, and actually, in actuality, the woman had 10 children. Um, but this family was living without food um, when the migrant mother was 32 years old um, and became sort of this very powerful piece of imagery during the Great Depression and really sort of symbolized what was going on at the time for a lot of people. What I've sort of come to realize um, recently, which I did not know previously about the migrant mother, um, probably because it's not updated in any textbooks that I've had that I've read about it, um, is that Florence Owens Thompson is um, the real migrant mother character. Um, she's featured in these images. And she was actually under the impression that um, Dorothea Lang said she would never publish these works, um, even though the government decided what they would and wouldn't do with works because she worked for them. Um, she was never sent any money. And when the government saw these images, they sent a bunch, like 20,000 pounds of food to the federal, from the federal government to this area. But by that time, um, Florence had moved on from this location. But shockingly enough, this woman is not um, white. And I know it's hard to tell in these photographs, but indeed, Florence Owens Thompson was, um, both her parents were Cherokee. And so this image that became a symbol of sort of white America um, and this sort of Madonna, like migrant Madonna um, 
she was in fact a Native American woman, not um, a white woman. And so it very much changes her, the dialogue that's existed about her um, and her image at large. Ansel Adams is a very famous photographer from this time as well, very different from Dorothea Lange. He um, worked with Alfred Stieglitz as well um, and was a founding member of this group F. Uh, 64 in 1932. This is an optical term because they habitually set their lenses to the aperture to secure maximum image sharpness of both foreground and distance. A lot of their work is about um, Ansel Adams as well as Edward Weston, who we're going to talk about next, um, is really about trying to um, capture light very extensively in their work because they're not using um, doing color photographs. Obviously, these are in black and white. And um, they're really trying to capture light and contrast um, as well as they can. So Ansel Adams is very famous for doing that um, in sort of landscapes of America. So like in um, Sequoia National Park and in Yosemite, he's really going to try to um, achieve um, this large tonal range in his development and exposure um, of work. So... Um, You've probably seen Ansel Adams' work before. He's a very famous photographer. But the way that he captures light and contrast in his work to get so much detail is really sort of what he's famous for, right? You can see um, all of these tiny little trees and the movement of the clouds and the mountains. Even this, right, every rock, you can see all the way back, right, to the mountainscape. And even doing things right that are not necessarily landscapes but natural forms. I like this cactus image. Edward Weston is another fun and founding members of this group, F64. And um, he's really one of those influential American photographs um, that really focus on landscapes but also still lifes and nudes. I really like his still lifes and his close-ups of singular objects. Um, I gave you a nude at the beginning because I think his nudes are fantastic as well. But um, he got a lot of his success for his kind of soft and strong focused images and really getting kind of capturing the detail and the strength of singular objects. And really creating objects into visual enigmas is something that's said on his website. The camera should be used for recording of life, for rendering the very substance and quintessence of the thing itself, whether it be the polished steel or palpitating flesh. So I really like his work and when you look at sort of the intricacies of objects on their own that he creates, um, I really like this set of particular work by him. Next we're moving into American realism and regionalism. We'll see sort of how artists in the United States are breaking down these ideas. So as I kind of previously mentioned with Dorothea Lange, we have in the 1930s opening up with the crash of Wall Street in 29 and with the end of World War I. It was a period of economic depression and political liberalism in the United States. There is this very much sense of feeling of spiritual isolation, Art became socially conscious, nationalistic, and regionalistic, regional, regionalist, um, battle against modernist abstraction, and instead focus on the American themes in their painting, whether chauvinistic praise of the virtues of an actually declining agrarian America, or bitter attacks on the political and economic systems that have produced the sufferings of the Great Depression. We also have during this time, the U.S. government develops um, this federal art project, the WPA, Workers Progress Administration, that's providing a lot of jobs for unemployed and really helps um, American painters to survive at this time. So we'll see a lot of artists working within this. We won't talk about it extensively, but they are um, working with the aid of the government to produce their art at this time. Again, like I said, Grapes of Wrath. Um, is written during this time, very much about this time, in 1939 by Steinbeck. If you had to read uh, this terribly awful book <laughs> in um, high school, not my favorite, not my favorite ending. Um, 
but very much about um, Dust Bowl victims during the migration to California. Dorothea Lange's um, migrant mother is very much a part of that. So we kind of separate into these two categories. We're going to talk about American regionalism first, um, which are illustrations and images depicting realistic scenes of rural and small town America. We'll talk about that. And social realism, attempting to draw attention to socio-political conditions of the working class by critiquing power structures behind these conditions. My perception of these two categories is that they're very interwoven, even though artists are sort of categorized by regionalism or social realism. Um, I see a lot of artists um, participating in both. So even if it's a picture in the regionalism section focusing on quote unquote rural and small town America, it does seem to be commenting in some capacity on um, power structures of poverty, etc. Um, so keep that in mind as we look at these works and I'll mention it as well. So Thomas Harbetton is the first artist we're going to be talking about. He's very interesting. A lot of these artists are very much not going to want to focus on quote-unquote modernism, even though they're all modernist, um, as well as not wanting to really be involved in abstraction. So we're not going to see that quite yet, um, especially with these American artists. They're going to move away from abstraction in their works. So um, even on Time Magazine in 1934, uh, Benton declared the rejection of modernism. I wallowed in every cockeyed ism that came along and it took me 10 years to get all that modernist dirt out of my system. So um, even though we're very much modernism, in modernism and in modernist works of art, um, Benton didn't like the idea in general. The work that we're going to talk about by Benton is this mural series, America Today in 1930. We're going to see a lot of murals at this time, so keep that in mind. Um, very much sort of ex inspired a lot by kind of Diego Rivera and uh, Mexican art of the time, so we're going to see that as well. Um, but this is his mural series, American Today, 1930. And this cycle is really about the theme of modern technology from the New School of Social Research in New York. And um, it's now at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. You can see all of these works together in all um, 10 canvases that are depicting this scene. So this is City Building. It's a compositional montage where you have heroic workers or seeming against the backdrop of New York construction sites. We have um, him really focusing on body and body structure. You can see sort of the muscular range that he's using that's connected to somehow um, in some capacity, maybe Michelangelo or sort of Renaissance depictions of muscles and musculature. But very much um, hard workers of the century and modern technology. So again, here's a regionalist artist, but he very much seems to be um, promoting the work of individuals and of modern technology. And maybe still continuing to think about um, the criticism of some of these things, like even hiding the face of this figure here. Uh, you can't really tell. They're not very personalized. Um, so maybe he's making some critique on um, the alienation that people feel in modern society. There's also really some great images in this um, mural as well. Here's a bunch of just modern technological advances like the train and airplane, um, etc. And again, having to do with regionalism versus social realism, here um, at the end of his mural series is Outreaching Hands, which is very much supposed to be um, a critique of this economic despair and inequality that's occurring during the Great Depression. So here um, people are sort of reaching out for food and for money, um, these sort of suffering figures um, at the hands of sort of industry. Grant Wood is another very popular artist at the time um, because of his American Gothic from 1930. And um, he studied in Paris, and this work uh, is now in the Art Institute of Chicago. Instead of having me talk about it, I want you to watch this Vox video. So I have put it up again in the links. Um, here is... Oh, I forgot to mention that Dorothea Lange has a exhibition going on right now, sadly, at MoMA, um, that you can't probably see. So uh, this is that Vox video on American Gothic to get an idea of um, why this work became so popular, which really helps to sort of think about regionalism and um, Grant Wood's participation in that. So go ahead and take a look and come back um, 
when we can talk about uh, the next work. This is a work by Andrew Wyeth, who's also considered a regionalist. This is Christina's World from 1948, set in the landscape of Maine, depicting a young girl from behind wearing a pink dress and lying in a grassy field. It's kind of this weird frozen moment, maybe it gives you like Wizard of Oz feel. Um, she sort of stares in a distant farmhouse in this group of buildings, and it kind of looks like she might be in this motion to move towards it. Um, but it's sort of still right at this moment. And this work was inspired by Wyatt's neighbor, Anna Christina Olson. She had developed a degenerative muscle condition, um, possibly polio, that had left her unable to walk, and she crawled instead of using a wheelchair. And so he created this portrait um, of her, even though it's sort of the back of her. Um, Wyeth explained, the challenge to me was to do justice to her extraordinary conquest of life, which most people would consider hopeless. So she's interesting because she refused to use a wheelchair because she believed she could crawl or move faster without it. And so she had this very sort of positive, strong personality where she felt like she could do things on her own. And Wyeth really wanted to make this sort of strong, personal portrait of... Um, potentially the psychology of who she was as a figure and sort of her strength as an individual. Next, we're going to move into some quote unquote social realist works. So artists commenting on um, the working class and critiquing power structures and modern society. So Edward Hopper is definitely one of them, though he falls into the regionalist aspect as well, as you can see in sort of this um, composition we have with this lone figure. He thought that, however, regionalists were kind of caricaturing the U.S. in their paintings, and so he really wanted to rethink um, introspection and isolation in sort of um, modernist works. So again, another work at the Chicago Art Institute. I wish we could go... Um, and look, it would probably do everyone some good, but um, this is Nighthawks. Um, and it's this interesting intersection um, of New York's Greenwich Avenue where two streets meet. And it's really this sort of timeless image because it doesn't really have a narrative. Um, and it, even though it's a sort of well-known 20th century work, uh, we don't really know um, what's going on. It has this sort of simplicity in form and idea. So really what you start to see is that you have three customers they're not really interacting with one another at this all-night diner they kind of all look lost in their thoughts and they've kind of can't congregated in this area there's also very much sort of the expressive possibilities of light um, at this time fluorescent lights had come into use and so hopper is definitely investigating the, in, that in his work as this sort of has this very yellow glow to the way that this building looks you also have the elimination of a reference to an entrance door, right? Like you don't know how the figures got into this space because you don't see the door. Um, this door is likely to the kitchen, right? You wouldn't just um, leave out this section. So um, this is still seems to be attached to the building versus you have this sort of long window, probably with an entrance um, further on, but very much to think about sort of this isolation um, together by these figures, though somehow apart. Apparently, according to Hopper, he did not intentionally mean to paint human isolation or urban emptiness, but unconsciously, probably, I was painting the loneliness of a large city, um, very much sort of the separation between people and um, congregating in this place together, but not sort of communicating. Kind of can think back to something like um, Toulouse the Trek or Gauguin in their work as well in Paris. It's been interesting to see how people have been talking about Hopper paintings. Um, I've seen a lot of this sort of thing um, come from Twitter, Instagram, or whatever, that we all kind of feel like Edward Hopper paintings right now, right? This sort of isolation of the one figure in space alone um, kind of feels sad and um, similar to how we all are kind of doing today. Ruth Miller Kempster is a very popular artist of the time as well. Here is a woman, thank God, right? Um, she won a silver medal for art in the Olympics when that was a category at this time. And uh, this is a very interesting unfinished 1950s self-portrait in which 
um, her withering side eye at the man's man's world. She holds her paintbrush like Corella de Vil. Um, very much has kind of that um, feeling, which I really like um, about this portrait of herself. She created this work, Housewife, which is really not something we've seen up to this point um, in this presentation from 35. And here you have the treatments of the American scene with a female eye, right? You have this kind of boxed in Renaissance perspective of looking straight on her um, in this sort of portrait of um, this American housewife sort of doing her diligent duty, right, of cleaning the house with sort of her oblivious child and husband in the background. And um, this sort of feeling of her placement in the kitchen, her maybe emotional and social entrapment and distress or deep sort of sadness in her eyes as a housewife, um, maybe about sort of herself as an individual or even about sort of the predicament at large um, of women. And we're really going to see this especially in um, 1950s depiction of women as well. Um, I get kind of the sense of um, Bar at the Folies Bergère by Manet and this kind of feeling of um, maybe emptiness, but also maybe strength as well in um, Kempster's figure. Charles White is another famous African-American artist at the time, really wanting to capture black dignity, suffering, and triumph. Um, and he spoke across sort of binaries of the civil rights movement. Um, this is very apparent in his work, Five Great American Negroes. Um, this is a Works Progress Administration mural, like we were talking about before, that represents really sort of this vibrant colored um, image of American um, black history. So you can break down all of these sort of five, five great figures um, in this work. So the first being Sojourner Truth right here, American abolish, abolitionist and women's rights activist born into slavery but escaped with her famous speech, Ain't I a Woman? You see here Booker T. Washington and Frederick Douglass. Booker T. Washington being an American educator, author, and orator, and he advised many presidents like the um, like Theodore Roosevelt and William Howard Taft. And you can start to see even um, in Charles White's work that these are very much portraits of the figures. It very much looks like Booker T. Washington or um, Frederick Douglass, though he's easier. And of course, Frederick Douglass being an American social reformer, abolitionist, and escaped slavery and fought for the abolition of slavery. If you had to read his book sort of in um, high school about um, being a slave in America. And then George Washington Carver, who is right here, who is an influential black scientist and sort of pr proposed alternative crops to cotton that depleted the land. And Marian Anderson was an American singer and activist. And when she was sort of not allowed to perform for integrated audiences, she protested and she was the sort of first black figure to ever perform at the Metropolitan Opera in um, New York City. So. He really breaks down all of these different figures in this composition and sort of their power, right? Um, Sojourner Truth leading people forward, Booker T. Washington speaking, um, Frederick Douglass protecting, um, and as well as Marian Anderson and um, George Washington Carver in their places as well. This is a really famous work by Charles White that you've probably seen before. Um, this is very much inspired by Grant Wood's American Gothic with the pitch mark motif. Um, but here he is showing a sharecropper woman who's standing at the threshold of her house looking over the land she cultivated each day but would never own, right? Sharecropping, it was owned by the government or by another individual um, and you worked it um, and would sort of get paid in some um, capacity. But it's a sort of intimate moment of dignity and she's really sort of this gorgeous, powerful figure. Um, I saw that her, they described, I saw a couple different sources describe her skin as a spectrum of harvest colors of gold and brown, which I really thought was um, beautiful. I also stumbled on his work Sound of Silence from 78, and it's this really weird surreal work, um, looking at a sort of contemporary black man in contemporary clothing, even though it's kind of the 70s here. And um, it very much reminds me of kind of like Kahinda Wiley and Carrie James Marshall and like all of these sort of contemporary black artists. And um, 
the only real information I could find about this work was um, this sort of shell being a metaphor for a hard exterior with a soft and sensitive interior. So um, he's cont continually questioning what we see and really thinking about um, blacks and sort of American society at this time. And I really like that this kind of has the connection to contemporary art that you've probably seen um, as well. So next week we'll be going into um, Mexican social realism and we'll be talking about Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo and then kind of moving into some other artists as well, but be super excited. I know everyone's always super excited for Frida Kahlo. Um, so I will see you guys all next week.